Good morning. Oh, come on, y'all. Y'all know better than that. Good morning. Oh, that's a lot better. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, it is a great day to be in God's house. And I'd like to say uh, welcome to all of the first-time guests and our returning guests. Thank you so much for coming back and worshiping with us to our Connect partners and regular attenders, welcome home. Again, if you are new with us, there's a card, a QR code, or something in front of you. Please, ma'am, please, sir, scan that card, uh, fill it out. We'll get you some information. Even if you have a prayer request, we actively pray over those as they come in. Uh, Pastor Keith and Amy are gone for a quick little getaway, so y'all pray their traveling grace and that he is uh, well rested when he returns. But uh, today, we are going to continue our series entitled The Exile that will be found in First Peter. And uh, we're just going to pick up where Pastor Keith has left off, and he left off last week in First Peter 1.20. And so as you're turning there, I want to ask you a question just to think about this morning. What does it mean to be a Christian? Really, what does it mean to be a Christian? I I understand that you may come to church all the time or as often as you can, and it alludes or seems as though that you display the characteristics of being a Christian. And I know that you're sitting in this conference of this sanctuary or this worship room right now, and you may be looking at me and wondering, Brandon, what kind of question is that? What does it mean to be a Christian? And I understand that that uh, if you were to go outside this room and somebody would, would ask you, are you a Christian, you would give them a resounding yes. So I pose this question to you, and I want you to think about it for a moment. What does it really mean to be a Christian? Although Christianity has a long history of evolving thought and even new terminology to describe all the facets of what is and what is not Christian. From hedge laws in the Old Testament all the way up to today in the proper attire for church. You see, in our current spiritual climate, I don't know if you know it or not, but Christianity is the largest religion in the world totaling about 2.2 billion people that confess to be Christians. This classification includes all denominations and variations of religions and hold Jesus Christ at the center of their religious system. But knowing all this, the question still lingers. What does it mean to really be a Christian? You may have come to the conclusion by now, just by sitting in here this morning. We're going to get to the text in just a second, but I have to set all this up. But you may have come to the conclusion just by sitting in here right now. That in short, a Christian is simply a Christ follower. Or somebody who tries to live their life like Christ. And I believe that it's probably the easiest and or the simplest response by way of definition to settle on. In fact, the Bible says in, in Acts chapter 11 that, that the people, the, the church folks that have been, that have been spread apart, that have been scattered, they, they sent Barnabas down to Antioch. And that while he was down there, he was exhorting them to remain faithful in the Lord and the steadfast purpose. Where does this Christianity thing come from, you may ask? In verse number 26, it says the whole year that Barnabas was there, encouraging the church, a great many people. And finally, it says there at Antioch, disciples were first called Christians. And the word Christian literally means little Christ. And as I meditated and contemplated on on this, I believe that Peter gives us a great understanding of what it really means to be a Christian here in 1 Peter. Little Christ sums it up. In essence, it is to be as much as you can to be like Christ. As we go through this lesson, I want you to, I want you to see something. I'm going to read it a little slow. So what happens is Peter tells us what we are to be. 
Indeed, as he keeps going in his message, he tells us how we are supposed to conduct ourselves because we are confessing to be what he told us to be. Watch the text. Let's look here in 1 Peter 1, 20, beginning at verse 20. Let us see what it really means to be a Christian. Verse 20 says, and he was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last days, no, sorry, in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Verse 22 says, having purified your souls and your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but of an imperishable. Through the living and abiding word of God, verse 24 says, For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the, gra- like the flower of, gla- of grass. The grass withers flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Chapter two, keep going. A couple of verses. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. Verse 3 says, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, we're grateful for this day. God, we thank you so much for this, this word that was written long time ago for us to feast upon. God, we thank you so much for this worship experience. And Lord, I pray that this word will go forth and find fertile soil in somebody's heart. Lord, that some sinner man, woman, boy or girl would come running, crying, what must I do to be saved? Lord, I pray that you would take this message and allow yourself to be used through me. Because God, if you don't preach, there will indeed be no preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. There are three nuggets from this text for our consideration that I want you to look at. The first thing is, Being a Christian means to be born again. This phase that Peter, this phrase that Peter has already mentioned, but mentions here again as culmination of all discussion, Peter had just given us on Jesus. So Peter says it like this. He said, Jesus, with the foreknowing comment, he said that Jesus has always been here. Jesus didn't just come just for the sake of coming, but he came for you. He came for me so that you could believe he was God and that he rose from the dead. That's evidence. So that you could be made pure and loving by being born again in and through him. Oh, y'all quiet on me, but I'm going to keep on going. But born again was first used by Jesus in John chapter 3, in his late discussion with a man named Nicodemus. And, and old Nick was a very religious fella. He, he was better than all of us. And I'm not just saying that to put you down, but, but he was a lot better than all of us. I mean, he was a keeper of the law. He was a theologian. And then everybody came to him for spiritual advice because, I mean, this was Nicodemus. I mean, he was a man back then so far as it came to spiritual things. And he knew more than all of us know. But yet, Jesus tells him, even him, he must be born again. Take a look at what he says to Brother Nick. Watch this now. He says that he struggles to understand. What do you mean that I got to be born again? I cannot go a second time in my mother's womb and be born. Jesus said, no, you done missed it. Watch this now. He says that we, which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say unto you that you must be born again. 
So we should gather that being born again is something God does in us and through us. Upon our brief understanding that Jesus is who he is. The work of the spirit is transformative. It changes us. In my life when I was 10 years old, that after my encounter with my medical condition, with my eyes, and then I could really see the realness of God through my healing. So after that, after that exchange, after that interaction with God, then my life began to change. My desires began to change. All of my wants and my needs had changed and my abilities and my capabilities had changed. I became a new person. In the old tan church, they would put it like this, that I, I looked at my hands and my hands looked new and I looked at my feet and they did too because I had been changed. I was born again, born of the spirit of God. Here is the point, according to Peter. Going to church, watch, I don't want y'all to miss this. Going, simply going to church, let me put it like that, doesn't make you a Christian. Giving money doesn't make you a Christian. Reading your Bible, although it is wonderful and informative, it does not make you a Christian. Being a good person, as as good as you are, and a big heart as you have, it does not make you a Christian. All these things are wonderful, but they do not make you a Christian. No, but being a Christian means that you are born again through the work of God's Holy Spirit. You see, it is an outside force. This is what happens. An outside force, God. Who brings the change that can't that can't manif- that can't mature and something that we can't do on our own? So God has to do something on the inside of us in order to change how we act on the outside of us. Now I want you to see this and think about this for a moment, for a bit. Peter, last week, Peter used this metaphor of inheritance. This week, Peter is using this metaphor of a baby. A baby, every one of us in this room was at one point in time a baby. And we used to be, we had to be babies and we had to be born. And at this moment in time, we all can agree that uh, no human on earth has been cloned as of yet. So we are all products of a father and a mother. All of us were once babies. Now, some of us were long, skinny babies. Some of us were cute, fat little babies. Some of us were let me see how I can say this. We, we, we had a face only a mother could love. But you grew out of it. You grew out of it as babies. Some of us were just perfect little babies. And some of us were preemie babies. But each of us were born, as a, and as a result, we were once babies. Now, let me ask you this. What, 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 do, what do you know about your birth? I know this because mama told me this last night because I called in and asked her. She, she told me that I was born naturally by delivery. And, and I know that I was a short, chunky, chocolate baby. Weighing a whopping eight pounds and 11 ounces. I told you I was chunky. I know this because mama told me so. But what, what do you remember about your birth? Some of you would say absolutely nothing. I, I don't remember anything, yet I'm certain that it occurred because I'm here. I I, I know this for a fact, but but I also can look back at the photos. You know, I don't know if y'all remember this, meaning goes and remember this in the 70s when they take our picture and and I look at those 70s pictures and they were red. I don't know what that film was all about. Y'all remember those pictures. And here, you can hear the stories, but I don't cognitively remember any of that. Did you know that 
Researchers say that it's revealed that our mind and our body remembers all of it. Our bodies and our minds unconsciously remembers everything. Though I don't remember taking my first breath, my brain does. Now, being born again is the same way. We, we may remember it perfectly or we may not remember it at all. We, we, we may not remember how we came into the acknowledgement of Christ, but we know by evidence that it happened. For some, being born again, it's an emotional experience, and, and it happened in an instant. For others of us, we may not, it may have been a gradual thing. All we knew that we, 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 we understood that we started going to church, and we kept going, and then all of a sudden, we noticed that things had changed. Our desires that had us before, they didn't have us anymore. I've heard people say in church that when I gave my life to the Lord, then all of a sudden he took the taste for beer away. God took the cigarette taste away. And all of these things is because I don't know how it happened. But all they will tell you is that I know that it happened. But the reality is your change was noticeable. You may not remember in that moment, but you know it happened because you can see the evidence or the noticeable things in your life. Being born again, according to the late Billy Graham, means that you are born from above. In essence, when you have been born again, the Holy Spirit invokes a change on the inside of you. That in turn, this is that evidence or that noticeable that I'm talking about that infects you on the outside. And then you notice a change. So you have to ask, if you look back over your life, I have to ask you these questions. I just want you to ponder them just for a moment. Have you been born again? Have you been transformed by God? And have you really been changed? At this moment, ask yourself, have I? How? And if the answer is no, I'll stop this service right now. Why don't you come to the Lord? It, it's okay. It's okay. It, it's all right. You'll holler at football games and you'll act crazy everywhere else. And then, but in church, when it talks about this stuff, so I'm not walking up there in front of all them people. I'll walk with you. If you have not been born again, why don't you come and come right now? I'll finish the rest in a minute. Let's keep going. As you keep going through this text, now, Peter is going to give us some noticeable or some observable elements from this text. Some measuring sticks, if you will. Because I told you how, how the text happened in First Peter. It tells you who you are being born again. And then it's going to tell you the benefits of being a born again. Watch this, number two. Being a Christian means you love. Having purified your souls, the scripture says, by your obedience to the truth. For sincere brotherly love, love one another. How earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again. First Peter says, you know what? Since you've been born again, like you say you have, then you should Love, have brotherly love, and love one another earnestly from a pure heart. You see, one evidence or, or noticeable thing, one noticeable outlet of being born again is that you love and that you love one another. How earnestly? Boone, since Boone's in here, I'm going to go ahead and say it for Boone. Young people would say it like this. How do you love? You love for real, for real, no cap. That's what he would say, Boone. That's what young people say nowadays. You will love for real, for real, not just faking it. You will love. Teddy Pendergrass said it like this. Now, this is on the, the earthly side. Teddy Pendergrass said, if so good, so good, loving somebody when somebody loves you back. But when you have been born again, you have to love them even when they don't love you back. Jesus said it this way. He said, the world will know that you are my disciples 
by your love that you have for one another. Jesus also said to love our neighbors as ourselves. Even when our neighbors are nagging neighbors, even when our neighbors are negligent neighbors, even when our neighbors are narcissistic neighbors, even when our neighbors, come here, Miss Tanya, are nosy neighbors in my neighborhood. Come on here. You see, at this point, loving the unlovable people requires God and not a capacity of our own. Because if we acted on our own merit, then you would have written your neighbors off a long time ago. If you had acted on your own merit, then you have, we would have avoided them like a plague. And if you had acted on your own merit, when that neighbor said one thing to you, you may not have acted so holy. You may have said some things that were unkind that you can't take back. This is why it requires us to be born again to carry out Jesus' instructions. Peter gives us a little bit more detail in 1 Peter 2 and 1. He says, so he keeps on going. He says, because you have been born again, because you have this, this benefit, he says, so put away all malice all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Peter says, so since you are or have been born again, get rid of the bad and crave the good. Peter is saying, you are born again, therefore live like it. Don't just act like it. That means to clean up, rid yourselves of the bad, all of those things I just mentioned, the word rid of translates in the Greek word that means to strip off. Strip off some of those things that are opposite of love, malice, selfishness, deceit and hypocrisy, acting and speaking deceitful, fake in other words, envy and slander, wishing evil or talking evil about something or someone. If you have, have you been born again? Do you have a capacity to love beyond your own will? If you have been born again, then you should say yes. But you can't do it on your own. Now, Peter gives us one more identifier, and I believe it's the best one. Like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk. That is the way that you may grow into your salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Now you see, surely when you are born again, you're just like a baby. This is the metaphor that Peter is using. Meaning those that have two at a time. And she knows better than me. Sometimes she'll say, I miss when the babies were little. And I'll say, I don't, because I don't miss the work. But she'll say, I still miss with the babies with little work and all. As a baby, they're pretty demanding to be such helpless and little bitty things. It starts with, with the taking of small amounts of milk every three to four hours when they're first born. But, but the baby with little cognitive development knows what it needs and wants, even with the faintest cry, it communicates its need, its milk. It says, it's time for me to eat. If we aren't eating, we aren't growing. If we aren't eating, then we will eventually die. Peter presses this metaphor into a spiritual birth. This is what Peter does when he talks about a baby and then he talks about your spiritual life. We must eat to grow. And one of the key indicators is that you have to have an appetite to do so. Appetite for God and the things of God. It's a craving. A craving is that having something that your body tells you that you just have to have. And often that craving increases and decreases with our activity. Do you remember when those little babies that I was just talking about, they they start crawling. And when they ate their first bite 
of mashed potatoes. It's just like Lay's. They, they had to have another. They couldn't eat just one. They had to have another and another and another. I'm talking about the activity level. Follow with me now. Do you remember when they became teenagers and they would just tear through a whole bag of chips in one setting? Wendy's biggie bag didn't have a chance. When, when, you, when you went from ordering off the kids menu to a full-blown combo, yes, their activity had increased and so did their appetite. The same is true for us in our spiritual growth, in our activity and our appetite. It works hand in hand. If you are growing spiritually and learning and doing and comprehending, hence does your appetite to go deeper and deeper into God's word and the things of God. Dr. Ray, Frank Ray, the Salem Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, he said it like this. That the Bible can be so shallow that the smallest baby cannot drown based on your activity. Yet, it can be so deep that the most maturest of Christians can never reach the bottom. But it's all based on your activity, your appetite for God's word. So your growth as a believer, our appetite for God should always be on going. Lastly, being a Christian means you crave growth. Now, one thing I'd like to give you is a warning about appetite and the activity topic. It's this. Appetite without activity equals attrition or wearing down or away. And activity without appetite also equals attrition. Think about it for a second. If we only eat and do nothing, that's unhealthy. And at the same time, if we do nothing and we, we, we don't eat, that is also unhealthy. Some of us get consumed with one or the other, but truly in order to really, really grow, you must have both of them. You got to have an appetite and you also have to have activity. Now this discussion leads us right into Peter's conclusion. Like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted the, that the Lord is good. This is Peter's question for us. And it is the most important question. Have you tasted and see that the Lord is good? Take a moment to look back over your life. Have, have you been born again? Can, can you see a pattern of growth? Have you have a pattern of love? Have you been transformed? If you can't, maybe you haven't tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I'm going to tell you this and I'm going to take my seat. Psalm 34 says, 34 and 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. When I taste a slice of, of my mother-in-law's buttermilk pie, I crave for more. When I taste Blondie from Applebee's coming out in that cast iron skillet with that brownie dripping with ice cream and cream, amen, somebody, I crave for more. But those things are only temporary. But when I have truly tasted God's goodness, I'm talking about a God that told you that he would give you the desires of your heart. I'm talking about a God that told you that I'm there to keep you from falling. Have you developed a taste for God's word? I'm talking about a God that you serve that says, you know what? I don't care what's happening. I don't care what's going on around you. You know what? All things. No matter what it is, good, bad, and ugly, will work together for good for them that love God, that are called according to his purpose. Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Give God a chance to speak to you and develop a taste for his word. And when you fill up 
on the spiritual milk and taste the word, you'll grow into your salvation. God wants you to grow into a knowledge of him, grow into the experience of him. You can't follow Jesus and stay where you are. I promise you, you can't follow Jesus and stay the same. Following implies movement. Following implies change and growth. Are you growing in your relationship with God? Are you growing in your knowledge of God and your experience of God? Don't settle. If you are not growing, then it's time to clean up and fill up, clean up some of that mess, all of that malice and deceit and hypocrisy and fill up on defining who God truly is in your life. Josh, I'm done. If you're here this morning and you haven't been born again, then I I ask you, I beg you to come and give your life to the Lord while you still have a chance. Come and give your life to the one that is able to save you, to the one that is able to keep you, that the one that is able to keep you from falling. And I promise you, when, when you when you get saved, then you'll understand what it means to, you know what, I, I know how to love now. I know how to love my neighbors even though they don't love me back. Because I love them even though they don't love me back because I love God that much. And then you'll be able to see Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good because his mercy, the Bible says that his mercy endures for all generations. If you don't know the Lord and the pardon of your sins, why don't you come?